Hi, everybody. I'm Jay Halfond. Um, this is Conversations with Experts. And on behalf of the um, Higher Education Administration Program at Boston University Wheelock College. And I'm very pleased today to welcome Jerry Whitmore. Um, Jerry is the Clinical Ass Assistant Professor in the Higher Education Administration Program at Boston University. And Jerry, I think you've been here a couple years now. You're, you're it's running up against almost two years now. Almost two years. Okay, well, pleasure to see you. And, uh, and, 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 and of course, I, I hope you're coping during this pandemic. We, we didn't have a chance to chat beforehand, <laughs> but um, you and your classes are, are, are operating remotely, as is the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, this was my, uh, one of my first semesters that I was teaching actually three courses here, two in person and one online. So COVID-19 hit as the online class was ending and the two in-person classes was going online. So had a lot um, transitioning there right. um, and then um, I have uh, have three little ones uh, and they're actually now um, doing online zoom classes as well so uh, so there's a, a, a busy household and, and my wife she's an assistant principal uh, here so it's it's all hands on deck and you know we're coping <laughs> Okay. Well, a coping is probably the right word for it. I, I can't expect anybody to be thriving in this kind of situation, but um, I really appreciate your time, Jerry, and, and I'll, I'll be, I hope, very efficient with it, but I, but I think you'll really add a dimension to the conversation. Um, Jerry, tell us your journey, your background, uh, because I can see where you went to um, school. <laughs> It, it, even those locations are interesting. So I assume you've come you've come from the south and migrated to the north in some process here. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'll try to be as quick and concise with this uh, this this story about my journey. Yeah. Um, you know, as um, as noted and as others can check out via our websites. Um, you know, I started education in uh, Tennessee. Um, I went to undergrad at Middle Tennessee State University, uh, and let's just say higher education was not on my my radar. I'm from the rural country south. Um, you either stayed at home, took care of your parents, maybe went to a community college um, to go into nursing as some form of health care or military. Um, my, my dad was in the Air Force, my grandparents were in the military, and so I wanted to go to the military, Air Force particularly, yeah. uh, with my best friend. Um, the 11th hour, or, or according to my parents, they said I was too small to go to the military, so I don't know how to, I was taking that at that time. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to take out student loans, so um, I was probably one of your um, average um, students that went to a regional institution that um, didn't know how they were, didn't know what their journey was going to have in front of them. And so um, I was very fortunate enough to um, go to Middle Tennessee State University. Um, uh, my mom got a letter in the mail that said um, there was this uh, black male, uh, uh, men of color or African-American men's mentoring um, cohort. Um, and uh, my mom, she, I'm a first generation college student, so my mom didn't know anything about it, but she was like, oh, someone is going to take care of my baby um, at school. So she signed me up for that. Um, I was able to gain some uh, mentors um, in undergrad that were able to actually walk me to financial aid office, help me figure out uh, my financial aid package or even how to fill out FAFSA, help me and my mom. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was also in the band. I was a music ed major. Uh, so um, what instrument did you play? Uh, so I'm a percussionist. Um, <laughs> so um, I marched in uh, the band, got to travel all over, which uh, for a country Southern boy, like traveling outside of the county um, and outside of the state was extremely huge, huge for me at the time. And so um, one of my, um, I had um, a couple of really good professors. Um, and since I was active in student organizations on campus, had some really great administrators. This stemmed from my um, time being part of this mentoring program mm. um, that really helped me um, kind of feel comfortable at the school. Um, mm. Middle Tennessee State University uh, is like many institutions. It's a predominantly white institution. Um, I think at the time, maybe it was hovering around 10 or 13 percent uh, Black or African American. I'm not sure where it is um, right now. 
Um, so there was um, plenty of opportunities to get lost um, in large lecture classes. It, um, I think it may still be the largest undergraduate school in the state of Tennessee. Oh, um, cool. uh, when you add in graduate work, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, uh, eclipses the, the school. Uh, so very large classes. Um, I did have a biology professor um, that saw that I was performing uh, poor or not up to how I should have been. And um, coincidentally, this was um, my first black professor ever um, or teacher. I did not have any black teachers K-12, which is uh, strangely interesting from my background. Um, one of our schools um, in my city called Milan, Tennessee, it was the seat of one of the um, Rosenwald schools. If, if people are familiar with um, the Vanderbilt and Rosenwalds as they donated to um, African-American communities to create teaching schools and opportunities back in the day. Um, so we had that school, but I never had an African-American teacher because when we started integration in the South, a lot of the black teachers were uh, pushed out of school systems. And so uh, my city was, you know, prominently as a case for, for that. Um, so she pulled me to the side and said, hey, you're not performing well. And um, this is in my mind, in retrospect, this was when institutions say they put systems in place to help underrepresented students. Um, persist on and and graduate. This was one of those moments where I felt as though everything kind of, you know, came to fruition um, for me. Um, so fast forward, um, upon graduation, I, I realized that I did not want to go into a middle school <laughs> and start teaching. Um, so I went back um, to get my master's directly out of my undergrad. So okay. uh, it was a master's in administration and supervision program. Again, um, our programs were catered towards K-12 um, administration and supervision. Um, so at this time, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what it is I wanted to do. Um, I think I was also, I had this great epiphany that was like, um, I think my skill set will be best utilized with college students. Um, I loved, you know, my coursework and uh, my trajectory. Um, in undergrad working towards K-6 population, because that's what my degree was in, uh, but I felt like I would be able to have a bigger one-on-one -on -one impact after those students had le left K-12 through and started to make decisions on their own. Yeah. Um, so um, after that, um, again, I'm a millennial, so jobs were just not readily available everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, for me and so um, I started applying all over the country and um, this small liberal arts institution Willamette University um, they they <laughs> reached out to me and I, I interviewed and that was in Salem Oregon um, and so I, I really point this out and the reason why it was kind of taking me so long to get here is um, the the position in Salem Oregon was a position in um, res life it was coordinator for fraternities and residential leadership Okay. Um, programs and so um, for student affairs and higher ed professionals um, you're basically a housing coordinator um, you're also a fraternity or Greek life um, advisor over uh, um, over leadership programs for the entire campus and um, also um, um, the advisor for RHA so resident housing association for undergraduates and so was it a residential position yeah. It was. Um, so I was definitely living in with first year students. Um, and I was also over apartments. So there was um, a wide swath of variety of roles that was, you know, and one and, and that's one of the things that you would you see a lot at smaller institutions, right. uh, where resources more trade. Yeah, maybe limited. So um, it was a unique and great opportunity. So, so think about um, this country Southern boy that didn't know that higher education, A, you know, was a thing and was going to be a part of his life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, being a first generation college student and then going across country, mind you, my interview there was my first time taking a flight. So, um, oh. So culturally, everything was just extremely different, and the student body um, was extremely different. So where I came from, you know, we didn't have conversations about gender and identity 
mm. um, and socioeconomic status as to how it played out. Um, just for, I'll, I'll tell my age here, um, I graduated in 2002 from high school and my um, high school yearbook had a Mr. and Mrs. White MHS and a Mr. and Mrs. Black MHS. So um, being, you know, in a segregated space like that, I, even in undergrad, um, in my master's degree, as recently as 2002. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's um, remarkable. I think, <laughs> I think we stopped my high school like in 2010, I do believe, around that time. <laughs> So keep in mind, I think um, one of the things, you know, going all over the country and being in different parts, I think oftentimes people forget that these types of lived experiences are not from 1960. Right. Um, you know, they're from the 2000s, you know. That's surprising. That's um, surprising. And, you know, my growing up experience, I remember um, pressing and washing clothes of this um, wealthy family in, um, in my city. So the, so that is my background. And I, and I like to say that many, um, many people experience that background. And one of the stories that's often um, not told is um, blacks in blacks in rural America. We we kind of often leave that conversation out there, especially when we talk about middle middle America individuals. So, getting back to um, the organ piece. So again, uh, being in that space, understanding private liberal arts education um, um, from a higher ed standpoint, and the demographic of student that you know tends to. Um, you know, want those experiences or enroll in those experiences was eye opening. Um, I realized that I wanted to go back to school um, and get my um, PhD. So um, Louisiana State University became that that option. Um, I was other state for you to move to now. Yes, and I, um, one of the great things about um, uh, being in that particular space is. Um, I was able to work full time uh, initially. In the beginning, I was assistant director of Greek life okay. um, there at, um, at LSU, uh, which is a large campus, a um, large, vibrant, active um, student campus. And um, for for those that may know, uh, fraternities and sororities are part of the fabric of life and breathing in the right. South. And then you add in an SEC school where you know that population of individuals not only run the institution they typically run you know the senior leadership of those states and in, in the south right um so you know i had that that awesome opportunity um to be there and um again while i was there uh, um throughout my journey i've sought out mentors that I can, you know, kind of lean on in those professional roles so um, so I can gain more knowledge, you know. One of the things that I've talked about since I've, you know, since I started in undergrad, um, I realized early on that I didn't have all the answers to, to life or all the answers to a specific career. Mm -hmm. And that if I talk to someone long enough or if I talk to you, Jay, long enough, I will come to find out there are things that I don't know that I eat, um, uh, I can be a part of, or that I can take advantage of those opportunities, or that I know exist. Yeah. Um, so um, while there, I ended up getting a second master's degree okay. um, in testing, evaluation, and measurements. Um, oh. So you know, on around the quantitative skills, you began to focus on those as well. Yes. So around this time, so we're looking at around 2010. Um, yeah. Um, higher ed, um, in particular, NASPA, ACPA, our um, larger professional organizations within student affairs, was really pushing everyone towards um, evaluation um, of our programs. Like, we have to be able to tell a story about what we do in student affairs and how we are being impactful and or, and or effective in our particular spaces. Yeah. Um, and so, um, at, the, at that particular time in my space, um, in Greek life, we were thinking about going to a different financial model um, to be sustainable um, at the institution. So like many other um, student affairs departments, um, many of them are um, driven, well, if you're in campus activity, are driven from yeah. tuition, um, tuition fees um, right. that you may uh, receive. Yeah. Well, 
one of the things that we kind of, as a staff, we realized is that our fraternity and sorority community was extremely active on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we could also uh, figure out a way for that particular population to add a fee right. onto their, their student bill that would be able to not only fund our office, but mm -hmm. be able to fund the programs that they would like to do. Um, and so we were able to put together, you know, this assessment plan to be able to tell the narrative about what our students actually wanted um, and how they wanted their funds to be utilized. Because uh, long story short, a lot of our fraternities and sororities felt as though their student activity fees were going towards activities that they were not participating right. in. Them. What percentage? Of, what percentage of the students were living in fraternities and sororities? Uh, so, uh, living in was um, is a was a smaller um, percentage. Okay. Um, I would say uh, the campus itself had a, approximately at that time of like fifteen percent that was part of fraternities and sororities, yeah. which again is extremely large when you're thinking about. Um, overall campus volume. Yeah, um, and a um, a particular. Uh, a particular population that we could mobilize at any given moment. Um, and so uh, what, you know, for the houses on campus, so I think it was around um, nine sorority homes that houses that were on campus. And so their average membership around the time was over 200, um, 200 um, students, around 250. Um, for men, we had, I think it was around like 14 or 15 houses that were on campus that averaged between, you know, the 100 to 150, somewhere around there. Um, and then we had many organizations, particularly those multicultural or historically um, Black fraternities and sororities that did not have housing on campus um, that had membership numbers where you would see them range from 10 um, to 60 or so. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, it was a, a huge um, swath of students, and um, so by the numbers that we put together for the um, Dean of Students and the uh, Vice President of Student Affairs, um, in conjunction actually with the President um, of, of, the, of the campus, uh, which had a, uh, the President at the time, had an um, econ um, background. He was definitely into metrics and numbers. Uh, yeah. He's very popular actually in higher ed. Um, F. King Alexander, um, who came from the UC school system, actually just recently went back um, out West Coast. Uh, we were able to have all these conversations um, to move forward and um, have a fee for um, uh, our fraternity and sorority community. I'm curious, Jerry, were, 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 so students can opt into a fraternity whether they're living in the fraternity or not. That um, is correct. Did, did, these, did these fraternities sort by factors such as race? Um, in, in, in other words, did, did, did so, they in effect undermine or, or undercut some efforts to, to force, not to, to encourage more interaction and integration? So um, you are absolutely right. So our students did self-select in a lot of these spaces. Uh, and when I say self-select, um, the students who wanted to be a part of the fraternity and sorority community so, um, self-selected into where they would like to be placed at. But membership would only be guaranteed from those organizations and those professional spaces. I think the conversation that you bring up is um, extremely interesting in the fact that um, I will say this from a free, free speech standpoint, um, being at this large institution is where I learned the most about the abilities of private organizations that were affiliated, had some sort of affiliated affiliation with the institution versus um, other organizations that were either sanctioned um, by the institution. So yes, we would definitely have trainings with these organizations to make sure they were not discriminating um, with students um, based on class um, and or race. Um, but these were also very tricky and um, interesting conversations. Um, I. Um, some of the viewers may know of, of, of certain fraternities, which will remain nameless in this conversation, that have historically um, held events um, that catered to, towards the Dixie South um, and or Old South. Uh, yeah. and that Black space kind of things? 
Absolutely. Um, and, um, and even to, even at that time, you know, while I was there, there were some organizations that would during, you know, football weekends would put banners up in their house, um, houses and drape them over that were culturally, um, um, insensitive, um, oh, to, to yeah. these very moments. And so, whereas, you know, we're having this conversation about entry into those organizations, yeah. I mean, we had the conversation about how these organizations were making campus welcome, uh, yeah. to many people. And we, you know, we had this over and over, um, and we were trying to toe the fine line of being a state institution, not crushing, uh, free speech in the eyes of the organization and its alumni, um, and trying to figure out how to reach, um, how to reach these young men and women at this yeah. particular time. Yeah, especially if they were self-segregating on campus, they perhaps don't didn't even weren't even meeting minority students and, and didn't even realize how insensitive they were being. Because you, you, your your experience reminds me of an experience I had back in the 1980s, which which suggests my age. I was working at Harvard University where students had. The, it, it, the students participated in a lottery to, to, to determine which undergraduate house they would live in, which was uh, the equivalent of a, of a residential hall. And it turned out the students were self-segregating. Even, mm -hmm. even black students wanted to be with yes. black students, white students wanted to be with white students, athletes wanted to be with athletes, et cetera. They, they were like, at least 10 different factors. And, and, and I, I did a study on this and it was incredibly controversial. And um, t it, it took Harvard at least another decade or so to decide that they were not gonna simply turn it over to students to, uh, to make those choices themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that um, dealing with that, you know, the fraternity and sorority community, with sororities there is this uh, National Pan-Hellenic Conference, um, MPC organization um, that actually puts together rules for for the organ um, for all sororities that are that are part of this organization. Um, for our predominantly white fraternities, there's the Interfraternity Council that also yep. helps with rules and selection, and then uh, the National Panhellenic Council uh, for um, historically black fraternities and sororities. And there's other ones for um, Pacific Islander, Asian, and other multi-ethnic and multicultural organizations. So one of the things that institutions um, um, have to kind of uh, tap, not tap dance around, but how to make sure they're servicing, you know, kind of all spaces and figure out what, you know, what bylaws, what constitution all these organizations have, what are the legal implications or the lawyerly implications that um, may be part of um, all of, you know, these decisions that we're making on campus. Because again, yes. Um, being in this space, which is the fraternity and sorority space is very interesting. Um, I think one of the other spaces I can kind of connect it to is maybe religious organizations that right. uh, may have some sort of association with the institution, uh, but the institution does not fully, I guess, dictate or manage the terms. It's, it's almost like an agreement uh, between the institution that they may be in that space and um, Another interesting thing for uh, for us at the time, um, fraternities and sororities have a certain amount of leeway because they own the property from which their homes sit on, um, and so they signed, you know, hundred year leases okay. um, for their property yeah. that is actually on campus. So there is uh, again. The, you know, outside of my time in Oregon was a time to kind of understand life was different and understand the student populations in higher ed were coming from these different spaces. And then right. how I internalize um, what I see on a particular campus and how I view that through a particular lens. So how, you know, Oregon was a time for me to um, acknowledge my unconscious bias mm -hmm. um, and understand a different um, population of students. Uh, my time at LSU being at a large flagship predominantly white institution made me realize, you know, more of legal things um, um, and how institutions have a relationship with the state. Uh, while I was there, I was subpoenaed um, a couple of times for, for documents. And Welcome records. to the club. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you, and you probably sued a few times as well. Who knows? <laughs> I was named. So, you know, these were, um, 
definitely interesting times. And I think as a professional, you know, these are things that are not taught in a lot of our courses right. um, that, you know, that you can, can particularly grow through. Now, I will say that um, this is where I lost my hair and I decided to go to school full time. At a young age. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and um, while I went through this, I decided to go to full, I mean, school full time to complete right. my PhD. And again, I was still on this this kind of thread of looking at how leadership and mentoring was helping students graduate. So, you know, my journey, I look at myself as um, one of the things I didn't talk about in my undergraduate experience. I was one of eight from a, fall, a small a uh, cohort of students that gathered, you know, our first weekend at band camp. Uh, we were all black. Um, and, you know, we came from different communities um, from, you know, the state of Tennessee, from Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, you know, those prominently, predominantly um, African American um, locations. I was the only one that walked across the stage in graduation. Um, at, at the time, um, and it wasn't until, you know, almost 10 years later, did another one of the group um, graduate, but- It took that long, it took that yes, long. I was, um, out of the group of eight, um, a couple of us were in the Honors College in undergrad. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am sure that I was, I know I was one of three that took what, what we had at those times, like these remedial courses that um, didn't count towards graduation of your undergraduate degree. Like I was in one of those courses, um, which was typical for a lot of rural Southern um, students at, at, at that particular time. I feel like everyone that came from my county had to take one of, of those courses because of, of how we tested into the institution. Um, and so I realized that it wasn't that I was smarter um, than any of the, these individuals. Um, the only difference in my story is that I had a, a faculty member. Mentors, yeah. That reached out. I had those other mentors from yeah. the administration. Yeah. Um, everything that the institution said on its website as what they were going to do for underrepresenting students, mm. they actually did it for me. And I realized that it wasn't a blanket statement. But not the other seven, unfortunately. It's, it's, right, and so, um, and so I really it's still it's, it seems like like in some ways you went from being mentored to being a mentor yourself. In some ways, paying it forward. Abs absolutely. And so this is what me got me interested in my um, research thread. So it was like, how can I, you know, um, uh, create interventions? and actually um, do research on that intervention to it see- Assess the effectiveness of those interventions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so um, I started working with this um, Black Male Leadership Initiative um, program out at LSU. Um, and um, also looking at um, one of my pilot studies uh, with my mixed methods research team was looking at how these student leaders we're mentoring other students, and then how was how is these co-curricular activities also helping them persist on towards graduation? And um, for many of us um, in the high rare world, we um, look at Tinto's research on social and academic integration of students, and I would like to say that my research thread kind of you know, builds on that. And of course, we definitely have our critiques um, of Tinto's work based on how it reflects um, under underrepresented or marginalized uh, communities. So, you know, one of the things that I was extremely lucky upon graduation was I had this unique opportunity to um, take a postdoc at a, you know, a large research institution. So it was either that or take a faculty gig at a regional institution and have a teaching load that was out of this world and wouldn't have time to, um, to actually do my research. A 4-4 load or something like that. It was actually a 4-4 load and program director responsibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a great place, uh, um, an awesome institution and program uh, that produce great student affairs professionals, you know, across yeah. the country. Uh, very well known as well. Um, Gary, I'm, I'm curious. So, so in your research, were you focusing on the influence of student leaders on other students and and their leader, their leadership skill? And and if so, do you find that 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 leaders created leaders? 
So a very interesting. So that's what I wanted to do personally. And that's what I have done personally yeah. at the time for my team, my mixed methods research team, we were actually seeing the impact on a student affairs professionals on those student leaders. Okay. Um, because um, early career student affairs professionals were experiencing, we know experience burnout. Um, so we were looking at this mass latch burnout inventory to see what was, you know, happening with those professionals. In turn, the second phase of that was to um, switch it and see like how was burnout of student affairs professionals impacting the leadership and mentoring relationships that those undergraduate students have. Okay. Um, and so that project is still ongoing. Um, I would like to say right now, uh, when I, you know, took the position at University of Wisconsin Madison, um, I was in um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute fellow HHMI. Institute fellow and um, I joined a postdoc team of four other postdocs that came from STEM backgrounds, um, primarily um, got their PhDs in genetics. And I was there to create a leadership and mentoring course, um, a suite of courses and programs for students. So Jay, to, to answer a question, this is where we and myself, we were trying to see what was the impact on mentoring of undergraduate students. Um, one of the questions that we wanted to answer at the particular time and what I'm trying to answer um, continuing on is do um, students that are um, have mentors in um, certain academic spaces, does that relationship um, help students continue and persist on in um, STEM spaces. So pairing a um, underrepresented minority student, uh, freshman or sophomore, with a junior yeah. or senior level uh, mentor, will that relationship help that junior that statistically has a, ch a higher chance of leaving the field and the discipline itself, will we, um, will we break that barrier and help them persist on? Um, and so, and, and that's where our work is, uh, me and my research team now that is, you know, where our work is um, diving into um, that larger question. Right now, um, I'm, you know, have currently been looking at large uh, federal um, data sets to do this. But this also, this work, as it is quantitative in nature, our mixed methods research, um, we're actually trying to build out these um, interventions. And so we have a uh, fast forward to now my time here at, yeah. uh, at BU, we have added on um, uh, another institution. So that was my full circle. And then, you okay. know, I, um, I've ended up here um, in yeah. these particular spaces. And so I think um, for me and, you know, where I sit as a professional and a faculty member, it, it has definitely come full circle. Many student affairs um, professionals um, that have come from my background tend to not take the faculty route. Um, and and not the research route either. Um, I always tell people I'm a scholar practitioner or a practitioner scholar. Um, I'm interested in active research. I'm interested in um, this, my student affairs background and evaluation background comes in. Like if if I produce some research that says X, Y, and Z is great, I need to be able to see it being produced, and I, I need to see it, you know, being you know put into action. Uh, and I. And that has been the drive since I've, you know, been in the field of higher education. Yeah. Do um, the student affairs professionals tend to think of themselves in so-called third space as third space pr professionals in the sense that they they are educators of a sort, and yet and, and and so there should be kind of a blur between professional and educator. I, I've I've often wondered about that because clearly there there is there is a there's an, there's an extracurricular curriculum in a sense that 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 things go on outside of, of the traditional classroom that does have an educational role as you say you know leadership be, being one of them but 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 to some extent we may have another version of two cultures in, in a university when we have student affairs and people like yourself who teach student affairs yeah, so you get into a, a very interesting point that I hope, you know, the whole field as a chain, I mean, field as a whole makes a change in the future. And and this center, centers around this idea of accreditation of, of programs. And so, 
student affairs in higher ed, the curriculum out there, um, it, var it wildly varies. And, and what I mean by that is that in our training programs or while we are, you know, uh, getting master's degrees, which is not a requirement for, um, for many people within the field, yeah. um, those requirements are not uh, held to, you know, the same standards, you know, as our peers that are in teacher training programs or psychologists or these other, you know, practitioner um, qualifications um, driven, driven spaces. And so uh, depending on how you were taught um, and, uh, you know, your, your experiences on the job, you will either think of your, uh, your work is, um, having curriculum, co-curriculum in a, this curriculum space and that yeah. um, this work should feed alongside, you know, what happens in the academic setting. Um, the battle, so we deal with that um, accreditation battle. Yeah. The other, the flip side of that is, you know, something that, you know, the, um, that higher ed has dealt with since its founding of, of Harvard University. And um, when we started to see faculty members take on, you know, these administrative roles and how we were to hire these individuals in the beginning of higher education, um, there was no, you know, assistant director, director of Greek life or assistant director of student activities. Um, you know, and then when we started creating these professional organizations, which the um, uh, NASA, the student, one of the largest student affairs organizations was created from a group of men at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, so, and, the, and, and that was later, you know, at the beginning of, of 1900 um, time. So, again, we have always seen this tension between, you know, these individuals that are not um, teaching curriculum academic work. Um, and, um, and those are not. Now, for us that, you know, do, um, uh, us that are, you know, we won't call ourselves um, historians um, and, in the discipline sense, but we will um, say that, you know, we're some sort of historians of higher education. Right. Many of us understand, and we know throughout the history of higher education, we started to see a boom in enrollment in higher education. Um, and we saw, started to see the increase of individuals that were graduating, because when Harvard was founded, students were not graduating <laughs> at, at these rates. It wasn't like I was starting school today and I was gonna graduate you know, in four years. And so we knew that once co-curricular activities and the co-curricular nature of an institution was built up, and we saw this with the increase in the creation of school spirit on, on um, college campuses across the, the world, we knew that that was very paramount and instrumental to higher education. And so, um, so we know that. And so for us, it, like I said, is that tension. And I think for the community moving forward, you know, 10 years, 10 plus years down the line, we really need to think about the accreditation of our programs. That's an interesting idea. Thus, um, individuals will be able to pull back or push back on certain institutions and say, hey, this is very important to the institution. And this is where the evaluation and metrics come in. If student affairs departments and campus activities, if they could create metrics um, and uh, be able to track students' involvement in school and say, that, hey, I can say that student A um, is graduating, you know, at a higher rate from student B, and student B uh, either goes home on weekends, does not participate in activities across campus, yeah. uh, doesn't feel academically integrated into the discipline or yeah. the, the campus fabric, uh, uh, fabric does not graduate, then we would be able to um, kind of move forward. We you know, over the past 20 years, we have seen many institutions come on board with this um, new um, idea of tracking these um, activities, which is in some sort of sense is this uh, co-curricular um, transcript yeah. um, that institutions have created. It's not, you know, it's not blanket across all institutions, but we have started to go down that route yeah. uh, that I think is important. But again, 
we have to, like in our program and in our, our, our courses here at BU, one of the things, because of my background and my knowledge, one of the things that I stress upon my students is to be able to communicate our jobs and our worth to everyone at the institution. And um, if we're not able to do that as, as a field, then we get pushed aside. Um, right. And, you know, this comes back from my unique experience being at UW-Madison. Of, of course, since, you know, my postdoc was not in student activities or student affairs, it was in biology. It was in our Institute for Biology Education. So it was in, it was in an academic space. And, you know, we had the programs, the activities that we had done were so successful because faculty members were in the room hearing that, you know, advising students, uh, high touch advising was helping, sending students to office hours or having them go to our biology center, you know, to attend programming or get involved in um, off-campus activities such um, as volunteering at our local, the local elementary schools doing science projects um, with, with faculty members was creating relationships with faculty members that led to summer internship opportunities like, doing all of those things that we as higher ed student affairs professionals do like that's who we can do all of those things in our sleep yeah yeah um but being able to showcase that to faculty members and um individuals that make academic um academic decisions yeah was huge and it, it was it, key. yeah it, it's hard it's hard to, it's hard to show the causality i guess in the sense that that's that, that a person who's engaged may be naturally engaged on campus it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that that's going to be a factor in their in their success and retention but but i think you and i intuitively believe that's the case that, right that, 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 that if you are isolated and detached and feeling like you don't, you don't really belong or you're not really a part of an institution you're less likely to persist Right. And I think, and so, um, and this is where, you know, these are the conversations that I have with individuals, with, whether it's faculty or other administrators, because they don't see that connection um, yeah. as much. And I think for many of them that don't read um, literature in higher ed, they, they don't understand it. They're like, we, we don't understand this connection. Um, for someone like me, um, from my own lived experience, um, and uh, I also am a uh, mentor for one of our scholarship programs here at BU. So I, I mentor undergraduate students, um, um, uh, students of color. One of the things that I have been able to do with those students, you know, when I sit in and have conversations and a couple of the students are not doing um, as well as they would like to academically. Um, and uh, these are students that went through uh, Boston Public Schools. I've set out and first question I asked them is, are you involved on campus? You know, do you go to your, uh, do you go to the office hours of your professor? Do you hang out in the, you know, engineering building, if that's your major? And consistently those students say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so in my mind, I understand, um, because I, I have subsequent conversations, um, but in my mind, I'm processing if this student is unable to create friendships or work with other staff members and faculty members, how is that student going to know of the benefits of being an on-campus student here at BU and absorb those resources? I, I, I tell this story, you know, one of the things that opened my eyes when I um, started at um, UW-Madison, because part of my um, fellowship is that I had to teach um, one undergraduate course um, a semester, and it was a leadership and mentoring course. Um, one of my, um, we were talking about um, tests being graded on a curve, mm -hmm. and um, one of my white students were like, was like, "Hey, I performed poorly, and I bombed that that test, um, and it doesn't matter. I'll be okay." I had a black student that said they were in a class, bombed their first test that was graded on a curve, and said that they couldn't do the work. Yeah. And they felt like they didn't belong. Yeah. Well, I asked both students why they felt that way. Um, the white student said they felt like they were going to be okay because after they bombed the test, they talked to all their friends that were in the class. And everyone said they bombed. Uh -huh. 
That's fascinating. And they were roommates. They all hung out. They were involved in other activities yeah. around campus. So they had this social yeah. network yeah. to where bombing this first test in this particular class was okay because yeah. <laughs> everyone yeah. bombed it. And even if it's not okay, they were at least led to believe it was okay, which in and of itself makes you more motivated, positive. As, at, absolutely. And so then the black student did not have a social circle of yep. individuals that were in the class that yep. were either taking the class at the same time in a different section nor had any contact with the ta or the faculty member and so they looked at that score and was like i'm not fit to be here and so this is where the research from claude still stereotype threat kind of penetrates the work and the ideas of the thoughts that you know that i particularly kind of focus in around again this is around how these co-curricular activities or these spaces, these physical spaces allow students to be um, particularly successful. Again, because this is the story of my life. And you know, one of the things I kind of left out um, in, uh, in this narrative is that, uh, yes, I was a music ed major, but during my orientation, uh, I went to um, the engineering um, part of orientation because I thought I was gonna be an engineer. Uh, but there were no students and faculty members that looked like me. So I fell back on something I had been doing in high school um, and um, that I was doing outside of school. It was just oh, and that's still, that's still true of women in engineering. Um, it, it, they would look around as well and not see many females. So yeah, right. so, 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 yeah so, so, so I think seeing those initial signs of community, I think are very, it can be very, very important. As we wind up, Jerry, I, I'm curious, um, Another kind of diversity is institutional diversity, and you've experienced that quite a bit. So uh, what are some of the um, uh, observations you've made having really moved around the country quite a bit? Um, you, you, you've almost picked the extreme parts of the country <laughs> geographically. Um, so, 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 so you've got quite a, you know, at a young age, quite a, 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 quite a cross national perspective. <laughs> oh, you know, so um, this is fascinating, I, I think if, um, when I get, um, when I get, you know, post 50 and I get to relax and the kids are out of the house, I'll maybe it write It doesn't work that way, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Maybe I'll be able to write a book or something about this um, yeah. you know, kind of later on. Um, I think I have to be honest and say one of the unique um, things about everywhere that I have moved around in the country, the institutions that I have been a part of have all been placed in urban centers that um, that typically don't offer as much admission to students that live in the immediate area. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, they aspire to move beyond the area itself, in a sense. Right, and so I think. First off, I think I, I just have to make that blanket statement because, you know, just like where I was at in Madison or here in at BU, at Baton Rouge was an extreme case of this. Um, history, oh, really? Historically, yeah. the institution, when you when you drive into the institution at any of the entrances, they have these large columns up that used to be gates um, in South Baton Rouge. Um, and it was in a, LSU was in a predominantly black community. Um, um, and because the people that lived around it were the workers um, for the for the institution and um, none of those kids or anyone was really afforded the opportunity to go to that school um, thus they went to Southern University which is an HBCU um, in the city of Baton Rouge yeah. both of them are land-grant institutions so it's kind of very interesting how how they played out um, all of these institutions I've been a part of have been at the Capitol um, capital cities. Um, yeah. And so that's the next point because that brings in political um, implications for the institutions. I say that to say how though these all of these institutions have talked about diversity, whether it was in hiring decisions and or decisions to broaden access um, to their campuses outside of Middle Tennessee State University because historically that was a normal college and if we know um, history of normal college. Normal as in teacher's college, not normal in the, in the, uh, right, in the sociological or psychological. Yes, <laughs> thanks for the broad audience. Yes, um, they were all, though that institution was geared to, you know, um, train students that were not afforded to the opportunity to go to school from day yeah. one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so outside of that, a lot of these mission statements um, uh, were more aspirational um, than they were in practice uh, for, uh, for a lot of these spaces. And that goes beyond students entering in these spaces. That touches in on, um, you know, faculty and staff hiring. Um, you know, one of the um, interesting things, again, the institutions I've been at have been, um, I would like to say, okay and or better financially resourced than many other institutions in the, um, their direct area or the region itself or the state. Um, so I've been kind of lucky in that aspect to be at stable institutions, but um, the institutions could do more from a student perspective and a, a faculty side. Um, here at BU, we can, we can do the same thing. This is my um, this is one of the first, well, this is, I think, the first institution I've ever been in that did not have, like, a Black faculty staff caucus mm. um, here on our campus. Um, I think that speaks a lot to the diversity of faculty on our campus. Um, and if we don't have a group like that that ha has natural, for me, from where I sit, at natural implications as to what students we bring into the institution. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what's the importance about that? Keep in mind, like institutions don't think about this, or some of them do. If you want to be a top institution that uh, brings in students, let, um, I'll say like a MIT or if we're, uh, I have a brilliant young cousin that did um, campus tours, I think last, last spring, um, MIT, Harvard, BU was on the list. His classmates, they were like top students in the country um, perspective students for engineering. Um, and one of the things he told me, he was like, they always brought out the, the uh, top engineer at their school and said that you could work with this professional. And so we want you because they were trying to bring the brightest minds. And I would think when I think about diversity of faculty and staff at institutions, if, if we have to think of that mindset as well, we think about it in an academic standpoint, but if you don't have a diverse, you know, faculty and staff body, how are you going to diversify? You, your student population yeah, and attract yeah, yeah. these students. Well, it's kind um, of a chicken and egg issue in a sense that, you know, yeah. minority faculty may be attracted by minority students and vice versa, but you need to have a critical mass of each. Ab absolutely, because, you know, throughout my journey, um, all my employers and all the institutions were like, hey, are you happy being here? And I was like, I'm happy for the work that I'm afforded to do um, at these institutions. I've been, you know, definitely blessed throughout my journey and had great mentors. Um, in a sense, um, I have lacked the ability to directly work with student populations that will A, be affected by my research and B, be affected by my, my presence um, at, at particular institutions, which is always at the back of my mind. Um, it will come. It will come. Right. <laughs> That's why I think I keep saying I'm, I'm still fairly young in the profession, yeah. especially on the faculty side um, of things. And, you know, I think those different areas gave me a, an ability to articulate the differences across our country um, from the prof perspective of all those involved in higher education. Right. Um, again, you know, working, you know, in the South and having a student that talks about coming from a segregated community and wanting to self-select into, you know, a white only, uh, white only fraternity, I'm able to have that conversation. That same scenario, if that student that came from a segregated place in the South came here to be you and also wanted to select self-select into a particular fraternity here, I think we'll, you know, have some issues speaking to certain, I mean, speaking to possibly administrators here at the institution. Um, it's just, I had this conversation with a potential, a prospective student um, into our higher education uh, administration program here. He made the comment, he said, um, I'm really interested in BU and I really want to be here. Um, is there any way that you could particularly um, connect me with any faculty members and or individuals that come from a conservative background and conservative ideology? Hmm. Um, and um, I, first off, I was extremely excited that, you know, yeah. he was able to have that conversation and that, that honest, um, honest. Like the boldness of that, yeah. Yes. Um, but I also started to think about, like, what did I say that also opened the door for this particular conversation? Yeah. Because he did not ask that of my other colleagues. 
no. And um, and so it was it was interesting. This is what I try to talk to my students about. Um, our, the language from what we use, and I pick these up from different parts of the country that I've been at, um, and it's been extremely helpful. Where whether, like I said, it was in Oregon, um, extreme, you know, Pacific Northwest liberal Oregon, the you know liberal kind of uh, Madison that was surrounded by extreme yeah. conservative spaces, and then just being directly in the South, now being yeah. in a big city. You know, yeah. those experiences have moved, pushed me forward. Okay, well, let's wind up because I, I think that's a yes. really good, a good point to, to, to terminate because I think it really shows how the academic landscape, you know, writ large across the country really is quite a catalyst, quite an engine for bringing people of all different kinds of diversity together. Um, yes. um, racial and ethnic and national being a significant part of that, but other forms as well. And then, of course, that leads to the question of responsibility, institutional responsibility. But how do you capitalize on that? Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and, and I think you've told your own story of how you did that from rural Tennessee to being sort of a, you know, part of much more thri you know, kind of state capitals, as you said, across the country. So it, it does happen. The question is, how do we, or well, the challenge is, how do we make it happen more often? Mm -hmm. Gary, thanks very much. It was a great discussion. Um, I, I wish we could go on for several hours more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure, and um, and, and continue to to cope. Um, <laughs> yes. <with the> pandemic. <laughs> awesome. Reg regards to your family. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Everybody.